think George referred to the Athabasca tar sands as a curse. And it will be a curse if it's not managed properly. Uh, it can also be a great gift to Canada and to, uh, to Alberta if it is managed properly. Uh, personally, I, I believe that this, this is a, an, an incredible resource. Uh, and I certainly understand why everybody is stampeding toward it with this desire to uh, exploit it as rapidly as possible uh, <coughs> because it's the, the singest, single largest uh, reserve of potential crude oil uh, next to Saudi Arabia. And in an energy-starved future, that's going to be a, a, a piece that's going to really uh, put Canada in a different position and, and help with energy independence in, in North America from OPEC oil and all that sort of thing. And, and so, you know, I'm, I'm practical enough and pragmatic enough and taking enough of a global view to understand what the, what the forces are, what the powerful economic forces are that are driving this development. But on the other hand, I think that, that what, is, what is critical here is for everyone to, to really uh, take a look <coughs> at what the fallout from all this is and what it could be, because we're only at the beginning of it. Only two or three percent of the tar sands deposits uh, are currently being mined. So imagine what that could look like going forward. Uh, just in the, the, the impression that I get when I weigh uh, everyone's perspectives here is that there are a lot of intelligent people working, working this problem right now, but that there's a stampede, there's a gold rush on, uh, that, that we, we haven't seen in North America since 1849. And uh, it's slowed down a little bit because of the recession, but it's going to pick up as the, the cost of a barrel of oil gets to that threshold level, which it's hovering at right now, and, and will almost certainly go beyond, at, at which point it's going to accelerate. And the curve is going to go you know, quite, quite steeply. And what I'm seeing is there are a lot of gray areas. Uh, I, I believe that, that given this huge economic incentive to Alberta, that the resources should be made available. Uh, because it will be worth it in the long run. It will be a good investment in the future to do the science and to make sure that the science is, is transparent, that it's open to the public, that it's not funded by industry, uh, that, it's, uh, that it's independently, that there's independent oversight, that there's proper peer review, and that the policies that come out of it um, are, are, are the policies that are enacted, the regulations that are enacted are based on science. Uh, based on, on proper studies, not oil company studies, because they'll, they'll bring in studies this thick that they're happy to pay for because it makes a good prop on the table at a, at a hearing or at a press conference like this. <coughs> but independent, independent science, uh, and I, I think that you know, the world is looking at what you uh, here in, in Alberta do, and uh, the decisions that, that, uh, that are made here are really going to shape the energy policy of the future. And, uh, I, uh, when, I, when I met with um, Premier Stelmach today, uh, he, he uh, um, gave the floor to his uh, um, Minister of Environment, or sorry, Minister of Health, to, to uh, in a sense, kind of re rebut the, this claim. And they had a study, of course. And uh, I, I, find that, I find that inconclusive, simply because the, the people in Fort Chippewan are afraid to drink their own water. They're afraid to, to uh, eat the fish. Uh, they're afraid of the river. They're afraid to let their kids swim in the river. Now, I grew up swimming in a river in, uh, in the, on the Niagara Peninsula. That's where my love of water came from that later translated into you know, all of my activities as, a, as an ocean explorer. So I can't imagine being told by my mom that I can't swim in the river. That's, that, that the idea of that is appalling to me. And for a community to live in fear like that, um, it, we, we need to, to look into this. We need, we need uh, uh, funding to do a, a study, an impartial study, uh, and to either uh, and to, to verify or not verify that there is a causal link uh, between uh, contaminants in the Athabasca River and what's happening in, in Fort Chippewa. And, and you know, I think that there's, there's a constructive conversation to be had here between government. I had a, I had a good meeting with uh, Premier Stelmach. We agreed where we agreed, and we agreed to disagree in, in a number of areas. But it was uh, it was gracious and polite, and uh, you know I think that that uh, there's a constructive way to move forward here. But it has to include 
the First Nations communities and, and leaders in that conversation right from the get-go. Not, not some, some uh, you know, uh, token involvement, but real involvement in the, in the forward planning. And I know sometimes uh, Hollywood people get, get accused of drive-by environmentalism or you know, drive-by causes, cause of the moment. Now this is a, this is a life, lifelong commitment for me at this point. Um, you know, I was, I was, uh, I was active uh, in environmental causes and, and energy policy and so on before Avatar. It's, it's 10 times that now. Uh, simply because now it's personal. So many people have come to me for, for help, and I've gotten involved with people. Once I look somebody in the eye and I say I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to lend my support, whatever that means, whether it's my personal time, doing something like this, whether it's uh, financial resources, whether it's my time to go, and uh, you know, uh, invite others to help uh, financially and so on, or whether it's just simply getting people to talk to each other or storytelling. Because as a communicator. As a storyteller, that's that's what I do best. So maybe it'll manifest itself in documentary films. My follow-up here uh, will be, you know, over the next few years, working working with this group of, of chiefs in these communities and all the people I've met on this trip to to see how this is how this is progressing and if we're trending the right direction or the wrong direction. To do this right. I, I maintain that you know development can be done right. It just needs to be done. It needs to be done with a with a, a scientific framework, uh, and, you know, good good regulatory framework, and buy-in from the people that are directly affected by the development. So we get that in the world. I think it's critical that any any discussion of, uh, of of energy policy that involves fossil fuels needs to be in balance with the discussion of how we evolve past fossil fuels as quickly as as possible. Obviously, so flying out of Fort McMurray was my God, what beautiful country. You know, I mean, I, I, I now live in a, in a city where the colors don't change, uh, you know, throughout the year. And, and it really took me back to my childhood to see, you know, to see the aspens, to see the colors, uh, and, and just, uh, you know, the, the, just gorgeous. And then to, to, to you know, fly into the, uh, into the um, you know, big open pit mines and, the, and the, the tailings ponds and all that. It's just, it was horrific. So I thought, okay, this is, this is as bad or worse than I thought it was. Then I talked to the oil guys, and I got their their perspective and listened to them about the about the technologies that they can bring to bear. And I actually found some hopefulness there, uh, because some of the things that they need to do for economic reasons are actually aligned to what will be better for the environment. And that's those are the things that you've got to find and encourage. So you know, I saw I saw places to be hopeful, and I saw places to be to be deathly scared. I think. The thing that everybody should remember here is that despite the sort of the business cases that are made and the technology cases that are made, you've got First Nations people with really legitimate concern. This is going to impact them directly, you know, regardless of, of uh, you know, the, the global warming issues, the economic issues to the, to the province and so on. You know, this is going to impact them directly in terms of where they live. And that, I think, needs to be, to be elevated in the conversation equal to these other uh, economic and business uh, uh, considerations.